Hey, Casey. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's been a while. Thanks again for uh, agreeing to, to do this with me. These have been really fun. And actually, like, one reason I've been wanting to talk with people about tools is I've had these lingering questions going back to uh, the discussions that we had probably like 10 years ago or something. And I feel like I, I never quite answered all these burning questions that 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 I had. So it's, um, it's really fun to get a, a chance to talk uh, again about this. I would be really interested uh, in hearing to begin with how you got into computing. Okay, so, <laughs> so this is quite, quite a long story. So it was always into aviation during my school time. And I, um, you know, started programming uh, some air traffic control simulators and stuff like that mm -hmm. when I was at school. And then I was, I actually planned to um, study aeronautical engineering initially. Wow. So that was my initial plan finishing school. And um, then it turned out that this, you know, the, the basic studies, the bachelor degree nowadays was uh, mainly mechanical engineering. And you had to do like a lot of practicals mm -hmm. during the semester break. And so this was, um, this was very weird. And I thought that what, I'm not going to spend the semester break in Greece. And then I started looking for some other studies where you wouldn't have to do all those practicals during the vacation. So, mm -hmm. and <laughs> Out of pure laziness, I ended up in computer science because I thought that you know this this was also interesting, but you didn't have to do all those practicals during your vacations. You could do other things. So that's how I ended up in, in computer science. Ah, that's so cool. I knew that you loved aviation, but I didn't know that it, it went back that far. How did you pivot then from um, from that initial interest in, in computer science to working on questions in biology? Yeah, so this was actually just the story of spatial proximity. So the the chair at which I used to work and did my uh, my master's thesis was the chair of uh, computer architectures at the Technical University of Munich. And in the old building, so now they've moved, they have been moved uh, out of town, but in the old building, which was just in downtown Munich, uh, the neighboring offices were occupied by a couple of microbial uh, biologists. Um, some of those biologists were actually uh, involved in the development of this ARB uh, database, like mm -hmm. RNA database and workbench. And so they were always complaining to, to the computer architects that uh, phylogenetic inference is taking such a long time. And therefore, they decided to actually uh, work together and, and try to implement faster methods for phylogenetic inference. And so this was basically how my my PhD project evolved. It's, it was just people talking to each other in neighboring offices. Were there uh, intellectual links that you saw between air traffic control and uh, phylogenies, uh, or was it you know a complete reset? I mean, they're both graph problems at some level. Yeah, no, no. So there were actually no links. I went um, when I was a student. I actually worked at the. Um, uh, Europe, Eurocontrol Experimental Center. That's like the research center of the uh, European Air Traffic Control Union. Um, and there I saw that, you know, this was kind of really applied research. So you could have good ideas, but the implementing the new ideas or using them was just delayed by governments, by airlines, by, by cost factors. So you could do research, but nobody would use it. So this is when I finally abandoned my trying to, to, to work in the area of air traffic control or aviation in general, because there were all those economical um, limitations. And so that was the point where I gave this up and I thought just, you know, um, working bioinformatics back then was a young field. <laughs> so mm -hmm. this was uh, 2001, I believe. And um, and it sounded like you know you could do something really useful by writing tools uh, that will allow biologists to analyze their data. So this this is how I ended up doing a PhD. I think there was a second topic offered to me back then, but uh, 
I don't even remember what it was. I would um, love to go ahead and uh, start by stepping through some of the RaxML code. Let's look for main. Right. Um, yeah, so you can see that there's a lot of parallel stuff going on here. So this was for a dedicated parallel version of it. And then um, we have a couple of data structures here. So raw data was the raw alignment data or is the raw alignment data. And then crunch data is the compressed alignment data. So mm -hmm. this was still inherited from, from fast DNA ML, which mm -hmm. was released in the mid nineties, also an open source code, which was used as a basis for further developing, um, for, for developing RaxML. That's great. And, um, so, so the crunch data is uh, basically the uh, multiple sequence alignment with identical side patterns. So align identical alignment columns compressed. Mm -hmm. and then of course we have our tree data structure and then the analysis definition that essentially holds um, all parameters that will tell the program how to run the analysis. So I'll just walk a little bit through the code and tell you what I, what I think might be interesting. So here this, pin to core. So now we're already going into the parallel world. This is for pinning a parallel thread to a specific core. And this is something, um, so we don't want a specific thread that kind of works on one portion of the data to switch executing on another physical core. So we want it to remain on the same core. Um, because then like the, 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 the data in the memory cache will not have to be transferred to this other core, right? So this kind of, so ideally if you have like those compute intensive um, codes, what you want to achieve is that uh, a thread always executes on the same core to ensure uh, or maintain memory locality as far as possible, uh, which will then increase, um, which will then increase the efficiency. Yeah, and um, this is something when you get into writing optimized code that's pretty striking. Like we all think of the RAM and our computer as being fast, but the cache on the CPU is maybe two clock cycles out. And often the RAM is on the order of a couple hundred clock cycles out, I, I think it is. So this is incredibly important to be keeping uh, the data proximal to where the compute is being done. Exactly. So, so this is uh, this is one effect, and the other effect is that um, we we think that we have uh, shared memory machines, like a normal server is a, ma a shared memory machine, but actually it is a, like a distributed shared memory machine. So, depending, so basically you have distributed RAM blocks on your processor. So, depending which address you're accessing, it may even like in main memory, it may be faster to access it if it's near the core where you're executing, or it take, may take a longer time to access it if it's like at, at a remote, more remote uh, distributed memory memory mm -hmm. block. So this is also something that you have to kind of take into account when you're developing parallel tools for, for shared memory systems. This is also something that is very interesting. Um, so this is what we call an intrinsic. Um, and what this does is the following. So the problem we always have in, in uh, statistical phylogenetics is that the we're, we're doing operations on floating point numbers that represent the real numbers. And this is just the the root of all evil when it comes to when it comes to programming. And so the, the problem is really with the benchmarking. So maybe I'll ask you a question, right? So um, if I have a vector, a conditional likelihood vector that is 1,000 sites long, mm -hmm. um, will it always take the same time to compute the entries of this vector or not? Uh, it sounds like a trick question where the answer is no. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, because this actually the, the computing time, I mean, you're just going linearly through this vector and computing the entries using a constant number of operations. Uh, but under floating point, the, the amazing thing is that actually the, the execution time of this depends on the input. So if you have very 
very, very small numbers, uh, what may happen is that internally the, the processor will generate something that is called like a denormalized floating point number. And this will <clears throat> trigger an error on the CPU, some sort of like CPU stall, which then takes like 30 cycles to, to recover from that. So if you're in those denormalized floating point numbers are kind of like an internal representation of very, very small numbers near zero. And so it turned out and we, we it, it took us, this was maybe eight or nine years ago, we couldn't understand why there was such a large performance variation in a very specific part of RAXML calculations. And then we, we, we figured, we finally figured it out. So we built like a little benchmark that just takes like, you know, one conditional likelihood vector at, at the root and like two descendants, like the, the input and then what is generated, what's calculated, the output and started benchmarking it and couldn't believe that there were like performance differences of 50% for filling a vector with a thousand elements, right? That is amazing. Like, you know. Wow. <laughs> and, and so finally, I think it took us like maybe a month or two to figure this out, that there was though that there are those denormalized floating point numbers and that you can by this command here. Um, so this was a French colleague who uh, helped us a little bit understand this. Um, if you add this intrinsics, those errors that are generated by the uh, CPU when you encounter those denormalized floating point numbers are actually ignored. And then we had very similar execution times for different input data. So, um, and of course, it is very much uh, processor dependent. Mm -hmm. And so there were, um, and this is also relevant for, um, for benchmarking large high performance computing systems because you don't know where the speed up or slowdown comes from, if it is just due to the network or the processor speed, or if it is due to the input. And so fortunately we found a paper that was discussing exactly this problem in the you know, high performance computing community that you shouldn't really trust benchmarks on floating point numbers that much because you can have this relatively large variation. So we observed 50% um, just depending on the input data. Here we have the, the finally the get input routine. So this is just the, the parsing routine. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this can actually also become quite tricky because if you have very large alignments like whole genome alignments, this can actually take much more time than you would think because you have to parse the alignment, you have to error check it, et cetera, et cetera. So um, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, unexpected uh, complexity or runtime loss may actually be hidden um, in, in this parsing routine. So this is something that one has to be careful about because typically you would think, okay, so I'm just spending all of my time in, in likelihood calculations and the rest doesn't matter. Um, but that's not really true because it depends on the size of the input data set. So what, are, what are some of the the major cost for parsing is it is it just disk transactions it's it's several things so of course it's um, it's disk access because the um the most of the parsers have been written you know maybe 15 or 20 years ago when we only had single gene alignments and where nobody thought about that the fact that this thing should be fast so it's just a technical thing that you're really just reading one character uh, after another, um, and then if data sets get large, you just spend a lot of time in there. And finally, another thing you wouldn't expect to, to consume a lot of uh, time that is hidden in this parsing routine is the, um, is the side pattern compression, where you just go through the alignment and look for identical sites and then compress them and just assign them a higher weight. Um, and, and this this was maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I tried to analyze a data set with uh, Mr. Bayes. And I ran exactly into the, this problem that the, the theoretical time complexity of this compression step was just suboptimal because nobody thought about the fact that this could be problematic on, on really large data sets. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so what we, and the problem is also, maybe I can make a little excursion here, um, the, the problem is also that this is a part of the program that is very hard to parallelize. 
because you somehow need to read the, uh, the, the, the alignment, need to do some error checking, uh, read it character by character. And, and what basically happens if you have a data set that is input data set that is a couple of gigabytes in size, um, all processors except the one who's parsing it will be just sitting there and doing nothing um, while, while the alignment is being parsed. And like, if you think about really huge runs with maybe, um, I don't know, 60,000 cores or something like that, you lose an immense amount of time of CPU hours just by waiting for the parsing. Um, so what we did as a workaround or as a cheat to get better parallel efficiency is that we said, okay, so this parsing is done only by one processor. It can be done by one processor. So we can do that on some lab server and then it maybe takes five hours, but it's done. And the, the um, what, what we then generate is a parsed binary data file that will then, that can then be read concurrently by all processors um, of the tool. So basically, when you start like, a, so first of all, um, you you will not have reserved 60,000 cores and then figure out that there is like some sort of formatting problem um, in your input. Right, right. right. So, um, so you won't lose time through that. So you, you know that there is no error in the alignment format. And basically, then you generate this intermediate binary file that you can then put on a supercomputer, and then all so there's no parsing involved because we have this binary format. So we know exactly what is where. Mm -hmm. And so all processors just kind of attack this binary file and start reading like different parts, different subsets of sides of the alignment um, into their memory. And thereby it's, it's orders of magnitude faster, just this uh, reading step. Of course, you can represent one nucleotide. So if you have like a... Um, um, you know, if you use the ambiguity encoding, like the total 16 states that you can have for DNA, then you can represent this by four bits. Mm -hmm. um, I think we didn't do this because um, it would have been more complicated to implement because then you also have the protein states um, mm -hmm. that might require more bits and some other models like RNA um, secondary structure models that also require more bits to represent one character. So just for the sake of keeping the code relatively simple, as far as I remember, because this was also quite some time ago, we actually we actually didn't do that, right? Because you always have this have this balance or trade-off between uh, optimal code and maintainable code. So between software complexity and, and code efficiency. And for us, um, this approach worked well enough that you just do the parsing and the transformation on a, some server um, and then just read this binary format. So I, I think we we didn't really look into further compressing it, but evidently, um, you know, this this would be a possibility, but there's like no, no real sure. compression going on here in, in the sense of like some sort of uh, com applying some compression algorithm. Large parts of the code, so this is something we um, we learn, are just error checking routines and useful error messages, especially because most errors happen at the parsing step. And so, if we if we design really kind of informative error messages, the traffic on the support mailing list goes down. So <laughs> probably uh, some advice for future uh, programmers of bioinformatics tools that this is super important because it will reduce the amount of support you have to make. Then, well, I really enjoyed uh, these print statements going through the source code. It was so cool to see all of this very specific advice that probably was copied and pasted off of the uh, the support board at, at some level. Yeah, more more or less. So every every user request ended up in becoming like one one additional um, you know print line or something like that. So. Yeah, I mean here the, this my rant about the proportion of invariable sites model in combination with gamma. Yeah, um, but, but this is you know this is debatable. <laughs> right. Yeah, but I love that that debate is manifest in the code itself. So that's really fun. <laughs> yeah. So here then we have this this very special model 
for modeling RNA secondary structure where, where certain sites can essentially co-evolve if they are in a stem region. So this was an awful, uh, awful increase in complexity for a model that is rarely used. So <laughs> then there is some more sequence checking. So users typically have a lot of exactly identical sequences in their input data or Partially, they also have sequences that just consist entirely of undetermined states and things like that. So that's that's what we're doing here. We're also checking for duplicate taxon names that is also happening or popping up quite off quite often. Here's at least technically there's some interesting parts. So uh, for the parallelization uh, back then, we actually didn't use OpenMP but pthreads um, because the program is running through a huge amount of synchronization points, right? Where the where the threads have to synchronize with each other. And this turned out to be not that efficiently implemented in OpenMP back then. So we essentially wrote everything by hand, including like the barrier that the um, P threads need to reach. In wow. Order to, <clears throat> in order to get like, um, you know, better, better efficiency. I think nowadays, um, it should be it should be much better, but back in the day, uh, you know, we had so OpenMP compilers were not that common. So this was at the time where only the latest GCC version could compile OpenMP code. And so here you can see that all those like master barriers. So this is a, a barrier that is controlled by the master thread. This was all hand coded, and the funny thing is that out of this, we actually made a very technical computer science paper. Um, I think this was in 2010, where we discussed different ways of implementing those barriers with P threads, how to efficiently implement them, like those, this uh, synchronization of the threads, and um, also tested them on different archi computer architectures that were available uh, back in the day to see which of those five or six web variants we had come up with uh, actually performed best. This call here is maybe also interesting. So this is where we uh, allocate the main bulk of the memory the program needs. So this is the memory that we need to store for, for storing the conditional likelihood vectors. That's, you know, makes up 60 or 70% of, um, of the entire memory footprint of any, essentially any likelihood based a program be maximum likelihood or Bayesian inference. So here is the, the 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 main switch. So here you have this analysis definition data structure again, and this is the the main switch over all the functions and modes that um, that Draxml uh, actually implements because you know I added tons of different options. Uh, over the years, some were never used, some were just experimental for, for some of my PhD students. So um, I don't know, maybe we should go scroll down to some some of the most widely used ones. Was it tree evaluation? Oh, yeah, so, so this is, that's actually where I wanted to stop. Um, so th this is basically, you, you just take a given fixed tree, so you're not doing like a real tree search. And you're just uh, computing the maximum likelihood score on this one fixed tree. So you optimize the branch lengths, you optimize the remaining parameters of the model, like of the uh, substitution matrix, et cetera. So um, here first, like you initialize all model parameters, that's the first call. And um, then you try to get a starting tree from somewhere. So I think here, of course, since you're giving it a tree, um, it assumes that the user provides a tree to evaluate. This is then like the main routine that um, deploys or invokes all the um, numerical optimization procedures for branch lengths, model parameters, and um, and things like that. And um, right. so this is also relatively relatively compute intensive, and it's also used, for instance, during the um, during the tree search, every now and then we're kind of further optimizing the um, the model model parameters. And what you can also see is that you know, like what those if defs, there 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 are names of colleagues popping up. Yeah, so one could yeah. for the if defs. So this is uh, Bastien Bousseau. <laughs> 
mm -hmm. who's been mostly developing Bayesian inference tools. Um, but uh, so I'm actually wondering what happened to this idea of his. We never followed up, but this was also a couple of years ago. But anyway, um, and so basically we do the model parameter optimization here until it converges. And then finally um, here, print, print the log file and print the resulting tree. And of course, uh, output the, the log likelihood score. And then we're done. So we're just kind of so mod opt includes optimizing the edge lengths then it looks like yes yes the edge lengths and, and all like all three model parameters and then for uh, actual like search without a starting tree uh which of the switch cases is that yeah let me let me try to find it i think it's yeah so it's the big rapid mode it does uh it does a lot of different things so um, here, there are some other options, but like the most widely used option is just to, to do a tree search um, on a pre-specified number, uh, number of starting trees. And so this is this, you know, do inference, um, do inference routine to which you pass the tree data structure, the analysis definition here, the raw data so for some reason there uh, we need access to that and then the the compressed uh, sequence data so with the with the side pattern compression mm -hmm. and uh that includes i'm looking for bootstrapping um is bootstrapping bolted onto that or is that a completely separate uh, yeah, operation so Bootstrapping has been specified. It will then um, just do bootstrap, um, you know, depending on the number of, of bootstrap replicates you have uh, you have specified. So this is essentially all everything that has, or most of the functions or the functionality that is somehow connected to actually searching for a tree, is somehow encapsulated in, in this function. Okay, so do inference does it all. <laughs> Sounds like yeah, yeah, kind of. Or is this probably okay. the most frequently called used routine in there? Uh, should we jump into do inference? Maybe. Yes, let me try to remember where that is. Yeah, multiple C line fourteen fifty three. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay, so. <laughs> Here's my friend Wayne Pfeiffer from the San Diego Supercomputing Center again. So this was <laughs> code we developed together. So that's why this is called Wayne MPI, like dedicated MPI version for Wayne, which he wanted to, to use on the San Diego Supercomputing System. The best likelihood that we found so far is just set to unlikely. So very large negative number. And um, then while we're doing some optimizations. There's our friend Wayne again. Um, then what we do is that we initialize a, a tree list for keeping track or for maintaining a list of some good candidate trees. Here we have like different options. So this is the uh, likelihood resampling bootstrap. That was didn't work that well in RaxML, but nonetheless, I implemented it. And then here we actually go into the main loop so this is a loop over in the number of trees we we want to infer so either a couple of uh, maximum likelihood trees on different starting trees or a couple of bootstrap trees um, and then we use a checkpoint counter and then every time like for every tree um, we we analyze or we infer we reinitialize the model parameters, so we set them back to the default values, and um, then we jump to this routine here. Where so we sorry, it, init model, does that define the overall model, or does that initialize the parameters within the already no, specified so it, model? It, it initializes the parameters of the already specified model. Okay. That's, that's what it does. So we just kind of need to set them back to the some default starting values when we um, when we start ser searching for on a new tree or on a new bootstrap replicate. Okay, great. <clears throat> and then here, well, we have the get starting tree um, function. So 
basically here there are a couple of options either the user specified a starting tree which is possible or um, we just generate a random starting tree or alternatively uh, we use a relatively um, fast implementation of parsimony to do um, stepwise addition order to build a stepwise addition order parsimony tree so um, that's what's happening what's happening in this routine and then we have compute big rapid don't ask me why it's so like that i i guess the get starting tree i i'm a little surprised i would have expected to see i in there so it's not that you have some set of of starting trees you're looping over it's just that you know you're looping over this a given number of times and then once you're in the loop yeah. you're figuring out where to get that tree yeah 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 exactly so we also build essentially like if you use parsimony starting trees we always build like at each iteration each tree uh inference we want to carry out we um just build like a starting tree from scratch okay so not like maintaining some set of trees or merging them or using some sort of fancy genetic algorithm for that or not so it's pretty it's actually pretty straightforward yeah and and um so the options for the starting tree there's usually user specified there's parsimony do you do the sequential addition like joe does in phylip or or is that not implemented in rexml yes and no so um we're, we're not doing that so it was it used to be implemented like in the predecessor or ancestor of rexml which was fast dna ml mm -hmm. um but we kicked it out at a relatively early point in time uh because it was a little bit too compute intensive because stepwise addition order uh, maximum likelihood just takes a long time. And the trees were not that great. And also the other thing <clears throat> that we couldn't that we couldn't kind of figure out um, was that, you know, can we somehow sort the sequences in a way like to be added in a specific way, in a specific order uh, to the tree um, such that such that they generate like a good starting tree so we experimented a lot i think this was a master's thesis i supervised we we couldn't we couldn't figure it out so there wasn't like a clear a clear pattern um i could imagine that maybe with with some sort of machine learning approach nowadays mm -hmm. as we were not able to see the pattern maybe maybe this could work but overall our conclusion was that this just took a long time and didn't really produce starting trees that were much better than the parsimony starting trees which of course we can get orders of magnitude faster yeah um so the idea was to to better invest the time the the maximum likelihood optimization time in trying to optimize the comprehensive tree rather than wasting a lot of time and getting like you know a little less of optimal starting tree than you would get with parsimony so yeah and so then compute big rapid <laughs> Yeah, so so this is basically where, where where the really interesting stuff happens, where we actually do, where we actually do the maximum likelihood search. So um, let me try to remember. Shall we go into that? Yeah, that would important. be great. Let me see where that is. That's in searchalgo.c. Oh, thank you, thank you. You're somehow quicker than me. Well, then we have, you know, a couple of important double values like the likelihood. The likelihood of the previous best tree we found, the difference of likelihoods and some epsilon. <clears throat> um, and then we have two tree list objects. So one is just like a list that contains one tree, which holds the currently best tree. And another list that contains like 20 promising trees. Here, well, uh, there's NIFDEP, so that reminds me of, of Mike Sanderson and the, the work we did on terraces. So we did some experiments here with terraces and tree space and wanted to print out like a couple of trees found by RaxML. Um, yeah, well, then we have a hash table and... Um, what are you hashing on it, there? I think it's for this search convergence criterion. Basically, what's happening is that typically you have this very asymptotic curve if you plot the log likelihood score over compute time. And so you spend like a large fraction of time just for very minimal uh, improvements in log likelihood score that are typically not 
significant in the statistical sense. And so there, um, I, I built a, a sort of convergence criterion for the tree searches that would break off a little bit earlier uh, by essentially um, computing RF distances between successive trees it found. So if those were very, very small, um, then the, the break would, uh, the, the search would just break off. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what the hash tables are for. So, um, so it's basically yeah. the stopping criterion. It's basically, yeah, yeah. So you can see that here, right? So this is like search convergence criterion. That's then we have this experimental stuff about terraces. So this was just like data ex for data exploration. So it doesn't do anything intelligent, intelligent with uh, about terraces. Um, and then this is like another list to store um, intermediate promising moves, essentially. Um, we set up a couple of search parameters. So this is famous, for me at least, famous thorough variable. So this essentially determines when you do like a subtree pruning and regrafting move and kind of insert the subtree into another branch of the tree, whether you want to do um, branch length optimization while, when like for those three branches at, around the insertion point or not at all. And it turned out that initially when the tree is not so good, well, it just suffices to put the tree into some branch, bisect it, and essentially not do any branch length optimization. You'll all immediately see if this move improves, will improve the tree or not. Or, so, so this is like also technique for pre-scoring potential moves. And then of course, every once in a while, if you found some promising move or like a move that uh, improves the likelihood, you will do branch length optimization because they are very closely interconnected. But in the early stages of the search, it, it's sufficient to do like a very superficial um, optimization or evaluation of this already superficial evaluation, which where you always do those lazy subtree moves where you just consider uh, optimizing like the, 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 the three branches around the insertion point. We estimate the model or we conduct a tree evaluation. So basically like we do an initial tree evaluation of the starting tree, which we've computed previously. So this is just the first implementation. Um, then we save the starting tree as the currently best tree in this kind of best tree data structure here. And yes, and then the, the, this is kind of rather interesting for the algorithm. So uh, either, so what determines the behavior of the subtree pruning and regrafting search that uh, we're using in RaxML that's been used in many other programs as well is of course like the radius or the distance of nodes away from the original position of the tree at which you will reinsert it. And so. And th that just I've, converges on nearest neighbor uh, interchange when it's one, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's NNI when it's set to one, and it's not NNI when it's set to two or above. And so here the question, the question was um, whether, uh, so either the user could specify such a rearrangement setting. So I think typically like the default would have been five or something like that. So we reinsert up to five nodes away. Um, but we also have this option. And so I think this is also generally important to um, when you're designing bioinformatics programs to try and, and guess or somehow calculate a good parameter, like a data set specific parameter for this rearrangement setting, right? Because this is always the problem like in general that uh, in bioinformatics problems you may have uh, programs you may have a lot of threshold parameters cutoff parameters etc cetera, etc cetera, that have some reasonable defaults but we know that maybe 90 or 95 percent of the users will never explore those parameters and see if they get better results so what we've been trying to do in, in all the tools that we've developed is to to reduce the number of parameters that you need to set in order to get good results or good accuracy and, and try to come up with, with ways of adapting those parameter settings to, to the data set at hand, because mm -hmm. this may, this may vary a lot, right? So also for the classic example is also the bootstrap procedure 
where some data sets have such a strong signal that doing 100 bootstraps is just too much. Whereas other data sets uh, have such a weak signal or may actually have, you know, uh, maybe two peaks in the likelihood surface that you're, even if you do 1000 bootstrap uh, uh, searches or 1000 bootstrap replicates, you will, this will not really like converge or they will not become stable because every tree you add um, tells you something different. So um, generally like, you know, this is something I kind of would advocate that you try to come up with some adaptive methods that adapt the parameters to the, to the data set. That always begs the question though, at what point do you adapt those parameters? Because it strikes me that the early um, steps of tree search, like as you say, you're asymptotically approaching a great tree. If you're optimizing things like the, the um, edit distances and things when you're proposing new trees, when you're on the steep part of that slope, are those still good values as you asymptote or do you need to go back in and reevaluate later? You probably have to do that, but this is this is also somewhere hidden further down in the code, right? So initially, um, we're, we're doing those very superficial subtree insertions. So where we just bisect, put the subtree in a, into a branch, bisect the branch, and evaluate the likelihood, and then generate an ordered list of those likelihoods, and you know take the best ones and evaluate them more thoroughly. In later mm -hmm. stages of the search, that's exactly what we do. So. We kind of, first of all, we do more thorough branch length optimization once we insert a branch. So we really, once we insert a subtree, so we really insert all three adjacent branches of the insertion position. Then we also, uh, so we do this kind of more thorough insertion and we also typically limit the this rearrangement radius or regrafting radius to five. Mm -hmm. But then we, when we're stuck, actually, so when we can't find a better tree, then we explore like an interval between 5 and 10 and 10 and 15 and 15 and 20 until 20 and 25. And then if we've still not found a better tree, then we actually stop. So, so that's interesting that you, you chunk it up like that. Uh, like, have you tried using like an exponential function or something that you're sampling from so that you are a Poisson distribution? So you sometimes uh, get really long distances. That, yeah, that, that, that might be, that, that would be a possibility. So we haven't tried it. The, the, the problem of course is that we, so th I think this is why phylogenetics from a computational point of view is so fascinating that we have all those continuous parameters and then this one weird discrete parameter, which is the tree, which is mm -hmm. very, let's say, atypical, an atypical statistical model. And this tree, you know, was, there's an ex uh, combinatorial explosion in trees. So um, this could work, but, you know, there could also be the odd case where at some point late in the search, just by doing such a distant move, all of a sudden, you can make like a big jump because we, we have this kind of weird discrete object we're trying to optimize. So, um, you know, under, I think for all other model parameters, that would make sense, but the, the tree topology is really full of, of surprises. So I think it would still work for most cases because when your search is stuck, it's stuck. So, you know, based on my empirical observations, but there may be this, you know, few odd cases where you all of a sudden jump like several log likelihood units upwards, like to toward a better tree. So shall we move further down or? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I'll edit this afterwards to uh, just yeah. very lightly and I'll okay. cut it out and make you look okay. very just fast and sharp <laughs> on all your code. Well, maybe, maybe it's also good to see that, that, that people don't remember their own code. I think that's mm -hmm. what happened to everybody. Then basically, this is really the main loop of this tree search routine. Um, so imp improve means that while the tree has improved, we still, or the likelihood of the tree has improved, we need to do something. So first, uh, we recall the best tree that was found during the previous uh, iteration. Then while well, we have all those checks for this uh, tree search convergence criterion, so before we go into the next round of topological moves, 
before every round of SPR moves, what we do is uh, this tree evaluate call, which optimizes all model parameters. Then we save this optimized tree again into our list. We call this a function that is called tree optimize rapid, which then essentially um, applies the SPR moves to the currently best tree and score and stores um, a final list of 20 best trees or most promising trees that were found during this round of SPRs. And um, those 20 trees will then, so we'll take each of those 20 trees and then optimize its branch lengths to see like the overall likelihood improvement that was induced by this, uh, by applying a specific SPR. This best tree list, I'm sorry. So basically this promising list of, of 20 trees is uh, generated in tree optimized rapid and so then we have this list here and we're uh, going through this list here. So from uh, one to the number of valid trees, so it could be less than 20. In some cases, we just restore the tree from this list, then run like a very um, short uh, branch length optimization on this and then check like the likelihood difference. And if the likelihood has improved, uh, we save we save the best tree. So mm -hmm. this is then in the end, so we go through this list of 20 promising candidate trees. And in, in the end, we uh, we save the best tree we found. And then we go to the beginning of our, uh, so we set improve to one, and then we go back to our loop here. And the, is the original tree in that set of candidate trees so that you could end up staying on the same tree? The 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 original tree, like the, the tree from, from the beginning of the from the, um, from the, the previous tree. move. No, 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 no. So if we if it might be in there, but like if you know the the the, the same tree, so we come up with the or we end up with the same best tree as we had before. Then we just kind of exit and we, we we stop the we stop the search. So just to be clear, so <laughs> as soon as it can't find a better tree within that set of twenty trees, it's done. It's done, yeah. It's done. It's, but it does uh, it does do a huge number of SPR moves that are hidden here uh, in this function. <clears throat> so it's not very. It's not very likely, right? So if we designed a method like this that would just do like one SPR move or try one single SPR move at this point, then this would converge very, very quickly. But here we're, we're essentially applying all possible SPR moves with a predefined radius to the best tree we have found so far. When you're searching on a really big tree, it seems like there's you probably get to a point where there's tiny improvements that you're eking out, but they're really not worth it. Is there some sort of epsilon or something within which you're evaluating whether yeah, it's better so, so <clears throat> there is the um this convergence criterion that's more like looking at the topological changes that are happening and then we also have yeah he, here is the here's the epsilon right so um ah, there you go we have this okay. epsilon that, that looks at this difference here um i, I guess we in most programs we probably already spent too much time in, in this in this asymptotic in this asymptotic curve. Um, mm -hmm. and the, the key question is whether we need to do this, especially for large data sets with little signal. I think it's it's probably not worth it. Which components of this are parallelized? Is it the likelihoods of each site? Are, are parallelized and then you aggregate those? Yeah, that's that's exactly that's exactly how it is done. So we 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 just parallelize um, over the sites and just so if you have an unpartitioned alignment, this is pretty easy. So you just if you have I don't know one thousand sites and you have one thousand cores, every core can independently work on a single site, and then in the very end, so if you um, if you reach the root of the tree, of course, um, they need to communicate with each other to to compute the overall um, the overall log likelihood score because every core can only compute the per side log likelihood score. So that's in the very end. Every time we need to compute the, the likelihood of the tree at the virtual root, that's where they where they need to um, communicate with each other. 
And how um, heterogeneous so, is the, the time requirement for calculating the likelihoods on the sites, you know, given different missing data and these floating point non-linearities that you're describing and things yeah, are processors so, waiting? No, so actually, so, so that's where it, where it gets kind of really tricky. So under normal circumstances, the, the kind of load balance is pretty good. So which you can just see by looking at the speed ups that we get um, by using by using this um, this parallelization approach. So in some cases, even with a huge number of cores, uh, we would get super linear speed ups, right? Like when running it on um, 40 cores, for instance, you may observe like a 50 fold speed up. Um, so that's what we call a super linear speed up. And this is just linked to the fact that our cores have more cache memory in aggregate available to them. That's amazing. Um, so this is this is something that's kind of well known in the world of, of parallel computing, um, but it shows us that this parallelization approach works well. So, but then there are two problems. Um, so one way of optimizing the likelihood function is, is a technique that we call side repeats, where you may have in one sequence at a position let's say an A and an A at position one and five. And in the other sequence, you may have a G and a G at position one and five. And that means like if you go up and con compute the conditional likelihood vector um, for, um, for those two child sequences, so just assume that those are sequences from the input alignment. So you're computing the conditional likelihood vector of the root of those two sequences. Then because you have the pattern um, AG, AG occurring twice, you know that um, uh, the, the first entry of the conditional likelihood vector and the fifth entry of the conditional likelihood vector um, will be identical. So this is a very nice property because with a little bit of bookkeeping, you can actually omit um, this redundant calculation and you, with a little bit more bookkeeping, you also don't need to, to uh, store a conditional likelihood vector of say length five, but because one entry is redundant, you store conditional likelihood vector of length four. So you can improve both the runtime and the um, the memory complex or not memory complexity, but memory requirements of this. But the problem now is that the time you require, uh, and, and of course this is at, at the subtree level, right? Because at the level of the entire tree, we've done this compression by compressing the side patterns. And so this, this level of redundancy changes at every node of the tree. And so as we approach the virtual root, the level of redundancy decreases. Whereas near the tips, where we have similar sequences next to each other, this, the level of redundancy is high. The effect of this is that, the, um, that essentially now we don't need to do, or we, we don't need to do the same number of calculations for every site anymore, because one site may share uh, two nucleotides with some other side and three nucleotides with yet another side. So all of a sudden, um, the computation cost per side using this very nice technique that yields big speed ups. Um, so the computational cost per side actually varies all of a sudden. And it uh -huh. also depends very much on which sides you group together on which core. So how many of those repeats they share. So if you put them on different cores, you break some repeats because some sites are here and some sites are over there on the other core. And we've been, and we've, I think we've published three papers trying to solve the data distribution for site repeats. And quite honestly, like nothing has really worked. Nothing has really been practical. So um, we tried like some very, so one paper was exploring like in a generic way, 60 different heuristics for doing that. The other paper was just doing some sort of very straightforward randomization <laughs> that didn't work very well. And another paper actually made like an excursion into, into graph theory. So we, we tried to model this, um, this data distribution problem like as a graph theoretical optimization problem, but this didn't really work out that well because this kind of graph partitioning we need to do in itself was already very compute intensive. Um, but that's 
that's a problem, right? You do an optimization and then all of a sudden you see that your parallelization approach that worked so nicely doesn't work anymore. So at Braxml, but it's the same for other maximum likelihood based tools. Maybe just computing the like log likelihood at the root takes maybe 5% uh, of overall time. Then um, the, the branch length optimization takes about, depending on how you set it up, 20 to 30%. And all the rest, like the 60% or 70%, of the time are, are spent filling or computing the conditional likelihood vector entries. And um, so and this is something that we can just run in parallel where the, the, the processors do not need to communicate with each other as long as each of them has like a consistent copy of the tree uh, and knows what to do next, right? So which yep. conditional likelihood vector to compute next. So um, it's actually not the major bottleneck, fortunately. Okay, and for those conditional likelihood calculations, are you using exact methods or are there approximate speed ups that that are uh, practical? So, so for that, we're, we're, we're always using the exact methods. Well, as exact as they can be, so under floating point. In the past, we've tried to, to move from double precision, so 64-bit floating point, to single precision, so 32-bit floating point. But for maximum likelihood, where you do all this um, numerical optimization, so you, you really try, try hard to optimize all those numerical, all those model parameters using numerical routines, at least we were not able to, to uh, make this work in a stable way. Is that due to a precision issue, or is it just because the numbers are getting so small that that you lose track at 32 bits? Yeah, I think the, the numbers are getting very small and you're, you're just spending a lot of time um, trying, really trying to optimize those parameters. So um, we were just, you know, numerical optimization is really a very difficult topic, and that's probably where most of um, the developers of maximum likelihood based tools have spent like 80% of their development time to make those numerical optimization routines run in a stable way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's kind of very difficult to understand why it doesn't work, right? So other programs that are kind of more, that are doing more approximate uh, optimization that don't really strive or try that hard to, to find the maximum likelihood tree or the best one we can find, such as fast tree. They uh, also work under under single precision, but under, for for XML, it was just not not possible. Yeah, maybe I think we could maybe look at the um, a little bit at the details of the like of the core of it all, and that's the um, the likelihood calculation itself, right? So that would be great. So like just to see a little bit how how. how how many different versions of this we have. So um, I've jumped over to this function here. So this computes um, like the conditional likelihood vector in the tree given two conditional likelihood vectors to the left. So that's x1, no, it's an x2, or maybe x2 and x3 are the children and x1 is the parent. We'll uh, figure out later on and then there are all those other parameters. Um, so, so just to to clarify, so you're using this circular node structure um, mm -hmm. that that uh, I don't know if Joe came up with it, but Joe uses it. So something something like this. So the so you're talking exactly. about like the the left. And, and the right. So of course the actual rooting of the tree is arbitrary, but each node in the tree is realized as a ring of nodes that's um, exactly. attached to the other two. So this would, would give you the likelihood values that at this node for this tree here, is that correct? And then yeah. the, you have the left and the right? Okay. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. And could, could you say a couple of words why about why adding nodes here uh, is is making this data object easier to work with? I think it's more complicated to work with actually. So um, th this kind of data structure with the cyclic lists of 
outgoing branches is I think very difficult to handle, especially also for computer scientists, like for my PhD and master students, because computer scientists are used to binary rooted trees. Mm -hmm. So an unrooted binary tree is something that is kind of very weird, especially with this apparently even more weird data structure. So the um, I think it makes things more complicated because there's a larger margin for error, especially when you're trying to modify this tree structure. Um, the main advantage is that you can have a so-called rooted views of the tree, meaning that per um, inner node of the tree, you only allocate one, one conditional likelihood vector that is or, or assigned to one of those three outgoing nodes. Right. That is, thank you, that is pointing into the direction of the virtual root. Right. So this allows you to store only one conditional likelihood vector per inner node and kind of like if it's not stored at, in the correct, at the correct outgoing node of the cyclic list of three nodes, um, then you know that, well, your virtual root is somewhere else. So you need to recalculate this conditional likelihood vector. So for me, it's more like a relatively uh, flexible mechanism to ensure that when you just want to store one conditional likelihood vector per inner node, which is very memory intensive as we know, um, to ensure that you can kind of consistently figure out which conditional likelihood vectors need to actually be recomputed in the tree. And it also allows you to, of course, avoid um, recomputing unnecessary conditional likelihood vectors. And then you can see here, so this is, um, this is actually ADX code. So we're explicitly using vector instructions to, um, so the ADX instruction set to compute the likelihood. But the first thing here, this um, switch here with the different cases, so this is very typical of many likelihood implementations, um, that you have dedicated um, functions for computing the conditional likelihood vector, depending on whether, so this is your conditional likelihood vector, and then depending on whether the left child and the, left, uh, the right child is a tip sequence, so just like a DNA sequence, or whether one of um, the children is a, is a tip sequence of the tree, so a leaf of the tree, and the other is an inner node, or if you're computing a conditional likelihood vector whose descendants are also both conditional likelihood vectors. Because especially in the case where you, um, where you have a sequence to the left and a sequence to the right, there are a lot of computations you can actually save by looking at the equations or also by using this the side repeats technique I, I previously mentioned. So there are a lot of shortcuts you can make. Um, you, you just not write down the, the equation naively as it's uh, as it's written in the paper. And therefore, they all all implementations nowadays typically have this case which like is it a tip to the left and a tip to the right? Is it like a tip on one side and an inner node on the other side, or is it like an inner node on one side and an inner node on the other side? So if, so if that's the case, if you're not treating the tips as having conditional likelihoods, how do you implement missing data? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I understood your question. Because isn't, when you have missing data, don't you just set the conditional likelihood of each state to, to one? Mm-hmm. And so you, yeah, right. So if we're missing data, exactly. Like all conditional likelihood vector entries at the, at the, at the tip are set to one. <clears throat> um, and this is basically, this tells us that we're assuming that there's nothing there. So it doesn't contribute any signal. And we also have like a dedicated likelihood implementation for this actually, because this is a signal you don't need to take into account. And you can once again, like, just as with the side repeats, but now we're only looking at positions in the tip sequences where we have missing data, just omit those computations as well. And I think you can see this up here because side repeats have been implemented in a later version of the code, so RaxML next generation. Um, you can see this here that we're kind of, we have this kind of presence absence map, which um, is a, is a bit vector that tells me for every nucleotide of my sequence whether there is an undetermined character there or not. 
And mm -hmm. depending on this, we can, we can still save some computations because <clears throat> those undetermined characters at the tips actually do not contribute anything to the, to the signal or anything to the likelihood because we just assume that it's undetermined. So here we're loading some kind of pre-computed values um, for the 16 possible states. So taking ambiguity coding into account. So we, do, we put this into a tip vector. So we kind of transform the input sequence essentially, or we, we have a, um, a map for the nucleotides into the corresponding conditional likelihood vector entry. So this is what we do here. Um, we have 16 states and then it gets a little bit um, more complicated. So this is a, like this presence map. So here now we're dealing with this case that the descendant, descending sequences to the left and to the right um, have undetermined characters in them. So we're doing some uh, sort of, uh, yeah, uh, bit twisting here, which is probably pretty, pretty obscure, I would guess. And um, then this is essentially our loop over, um, over the number of sites that this core, for which this core has to compute the conditional likelihood vector entries, right? So n is just the length of the conditional likelihood vector. And then we do some loading. So this is um, the tip sequence uh, multiplied with this pre-calculated value here with the transition probability matrix. And then here, this is kind of um, hard coded. We, um, we iterate over the four discrete gamma rates. So this was one of the maybe things that were not so good in, in RaxML that we just allow four discrete rates for the gamma model of rate heterogeneity. And then here, this is actually the, um, the point where we do where we do the actual calculations of the entries of the conditional likelihood vector, right? So this is the innermost loop of it. So we do some, some loading of vectors, um, then some vector multiplication, again, a load operation. Then here you can see that the instruction sets changed over time. So on older x86 architectures, when we started doing that, um, we would do this operation here uh, which could then be done like just in one single operation. This is a so-called fused uh, multiply add operation um, later on. And well, the, you know, the remaining functions like for tip on one side, inner node on the other side, um, the remaining functions are just getting a little bit more, more complicated. Um, so I, I don't think that it's, it's really worth going, going through them because it's- Okay. Uh, admittedly pretty hard uh, pretty hard to read them yeah and pretty hard to implement them <laughs> there's a lot to keep track of yeah. yeah to implement them efficiently right because you end up having like a dedicated function like this for every data type like for protein data for for binary data for some sort of 16 uh, like 16 state data with 16 non-ambiguous states and so on and so forth and so that adds a lot to the um to code complexity. So is there an intrinsic trade-off here between like the generality of the data types and models that can be used and the optimization? Like, did you have to split out these functions necessarily to get the level of optimization that you wanted? Yes, yes, exactly. So that, that, that's exactly the case. The more, the more performance you want to get out of the code, of a code, the more special cases of the like core functions that dominate the runtime of the code you have you have to implement right so we talked about all those techniques that you somehow try to ignore um, that you try to ignore undetermined states that you have special cases depending on where in the tree you are like at what kind of node you're computing a conditional likelihood vector uh, we have those the side repeats technique we have different models like the gamma model or the plane model which in in, in RaxML, like the, the model without rate heterogeneity has its own set of functions that look like this um so you sacrifice a lot of generality and also maintainability for mm -hmm. um for performance so here still you know it's it's basically three functions we have to to 
optimize, optimize like this. It's updating a conditional likelihood vector. It's the function for branch length optimization where we typically need the newton refson or apply the newton refson procedure and where we need to compute the derivatives of the likelihood function. So this is a little bit gets a little bit more complex. And then the function to actually compute the likelihood at the root of the tree. So those are like the three function types that then ended up, there must be, I've never counted them, but there must be at least 50 or 60 different implementations for those wow. three uh, functions, the, you know, original, original RxML code. And that must make it very difficult to continue to implement new ideas because all of a sudden to change one methodological thing, you have this expanding number of implementations that that, that touches. Exactly. So you you, sacri you sacrifice flexibility and, and you know the, the code had become very complex. So this is the also the reason why we um, why we completely essentially rewrote uh, RaxML. So now it's called RaxML NG next generation, mm -hmm. where we kind of incorporated all the lessons learned mm -hmm. um, from RaxML development because of this you know, it kind of was developed over time period of well, almost 15 years, but then we stopped it and like redid it from scratch and also now have kind of separated the tree search functionality from the actual likelihood kernel. So this is like just a, a library that we also use for other projects. So the core library here, those, you know, those functions for updating conditional likelihood vectors, et cetera. So they are now in a library and then we're just writing applications around this library. Mm -hmm. um, so I um, mean, this is I, this is the challenge getting into a problem like this. Like until you really get into it, it's it's so hard to know what the appropriate abstraction layers are within the problem. So so where does one module stop and another module begin? You know how how can you carve it, you know, like a butcher, you know, where, where are this, the seams and the problem? You learn so much from your initial implementation that you just need to go back and refactor entirely yeah. based on, on what you've learned. Yeah, that's, that's really what we've been doing a lot in, in, in the recent like three to four years. So we, um, we re-implemented model tests as well, based on the, the library we developed. We re-implemented this evolutionary placement algorithm that basically just kind of throws reads on a given reference tree and finds like, you know, from metagenetic studies where the where the best placement for each read is without really extending the tree. Um, so this was part of RaxML that became so complex that this was turned into an application of its own. Um, and so we're, we're constantly now looking at those re-engineering re-engineering projects just to also ensure maintainability and sustainability for the next couple of years. Now also, you know, using C++ instead of uh, C code. So I'm like the, the only dinosaur in, in my lab who <laughs> is still occasionally programming in C. Everybody yeah. else uh, is coding in C++ now. So. Yeah. And so you mentioned that library. I remember seeing it in your uh, GitHub repos. What was that called? The generalized um, likelihood library? Lib, yeah, it's called libpll library for phylogenetic likelihood. Okay. Um, we're, we're kind of, you know, we're currently, we have a version that also includes site repeats and a lot of other features for saving memory. So somehow we're trying to, to integrate all those ideas that were just like distributed over several proof of concept implementations, some quick hacks to first test if the thing works. And now it's kind of hopefully, you know, getting closer to, to production level, but it, it seems to work quite well and, and be relatively stable so far. 
Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Claudia and I, in our conversation, we're, we're talking about this like hyper volume of tools at, and you know these orthogonal axes that are exactly along the lines of what we're talking about here. So uh, there is you know optimization for speed, there's generality, uh, there is sort of um, some engineering practices about uh, how flexible the code base is, uh, the size of data sets you can work with, um, and and all of these things. It's it's really interesting to think about how we really need a diversity of tools because no one tool can occupy that whole hyper volume. But then also to think about what are the clean sutures between these tools. You know how how do we best divide up these tasks and things and. Mm -hmm. What are the unoccupied yeah. spaces? I, this is definitely also also like a lesson I learned. So nowadays, or maybe in the last two to three years, we we've started talking much more much more about uh, software engineering issues in the lab than than we used to before, just because of the increased complexity. Because you know, in computer science, when you study computer science, uh, software engineering, oh, it's all only those guys that talk about software, but don't know anything about writing real, real code. And um, we, we've, you know, we've, uh, we've changed our opinions uh, here of this very much, because uh, all those software engineering issues are really important. So we have like group discussions in the lab where we discuss how to best define an interface or like separate the library from the application or whether where we discuss the trade-offs, whether it's worth to implement this idea that might yield another 5% compared of additional performance compared to the, you know, uh, code complexity increase. And um, so, you know, this has become like a favorite topic recently. So we're trying to also work a little bit more quantitatively in this area to, to try and, and um, rate our tools in terms of, uh, of software quality. Um, so we've recently developed like a little, you know, benchmark tool. Yeah, Softwipe. Will, yeah, 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 exactly. That will take, uh, you know, open source C or C++ codes and just rank them based on some, you know, criteria that you would consider as being reasonable for quantifying code quality. So, um, and I mean, you know, code quality doesn't mean that the code is correct, just that there is a strong correlation of, uh, between code quality and error rate or bug rate. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that researchers in empirical software engineering have uh, derived. And so it has, you know, it, it's, it's really fun because we, we, we do get this internal, like, you know, healthy competition in the lab that of course they're, they're mainly computer scientists and everybody wants to write like the best code with the highest soft wipe score and yeah. this this really makes uh students um be more careful about their their code quality and their coding style we had one occasion where our tool also helped to prevent a bug so this is kind of something that you would regularly actually apply to your code and um so you know this is something that just we've been forced to look more at those aspects just because of the the complexity of the tools that we've I absolutely figured. yeah do you anticipate or intend for Softwipe to be used almost like the way you would use uh linting or unit tests just something that you know every time you commit your code it's giving you a soft white score that yeah, that was that was one idea we had. So the you know the integration of course um, is not that easy because um, there. So it's basically technicalities that need to be resolved for which you for which you would need like a larger uh, team of, of software engineers to set it up mm -hmm. such that it works in a reliable way. But this is one of the ideas we had. The other uh, idea was that. You know, some tool like this, of course, not our own, but some tool should maybe also be used when people are um, kind of submitting uh, software papers. So you have the bioinformatics software track. So the, the application notes uh, you have in systematic biology, you now have a software track in molecular biology and evolution, you have a software track. And so there, 
what, what I want to achieve is that people start thinking more about the quality of their software um, upon submitting um, such tools. So one idea would be to just have like a box and ask them, ask the, the authors that are submitting the papers, what measures did you take to, um, you know, assess the quality of your software? So one would be verification, for instance. So you've designed a tool that does the same thing as another one, but is much faster. So have you really done specific experiments to verify that you get the same results? So that's what everybody assumes, but you rarely see it in a paper. And another thing, um, and other things that they could, of course, you know, run soft wipe or uh, assess the, 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 the cyclomatic complexity of their code, or even, I mean, what would be sufficient for me would just be if they listed all the warnings they got when when compiling with GCC and all <laughs> warnings turned on or Clang and all warnings turned on. And the reality is that most of the people developing code have never really activated those uh, those warnings. Um, so for me, this this would be a very good start. Like, yeah, it's just it's... another thing because you know this has been like I'm, I'm excited about this. So the other cool thing you can do, of course, um, if you have enough students and a programming practical, is that you can give them the same specification and have two independent teams um, develop uh, implement an algorithm for that same specification different code, mm -hmm. right? So this is what you people typically do for uh, security critical systems like autopilots or something like that. Um, so fortunately, in one instance where we actually did some implemented a discrete algorithm for uh, enumerating the trees on a phylogenetic terrace, we had very good master's level students in this programming practical and we had two teams and then we could really kind of verify that the two teams That's so got fun. the same results. So, the role of, of engineering in science, uh, you know, it's a huge subject in and of itself, but a lot of the central tensions become very apparent around uh, software engineering in particular. It's, you know, especially if you're uh, training someone who's coming to coding as a biologist and they're looking at coding uh, as a skill, you know, like a bench skill that they would learn or a, a field research skill they would learn. It's so rewarding to like write code that's that's running and, and be empowered that way. Uh, and that's very self-motivating, but it's sometimes harder to convey to people how important the engineering aspects of it are uh, and, and things like just following conventions, like the idea that you mm -hmm. can get things to work uh, with text files of code that look very different, but that it's actually really important to not only get it to run, but to follow conventions and expectations when, when you're doing that, uh, both because those conventions are there because they tend to work well, but also uh, for, for readability. And sometimes I wonder, you know, how much to emphasize the, that convention and, and linting end of things, because it can be discouraging to, to someone who's, you know, really enjoying that satisfaction of getting their, their first code to run. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's very difficult to, to, to convey because you start with little projects and maybe you build an initial tool that has two or 3000 lines of code. So where you still have like a good overview, it's not that difficult to maintain, but then it grows over years. And then, you know, at some point mm -hmm. you lose track. So I'm, I'm afraid that you can only learn this through experience, right? Because this was, this was the, the, the experience I made when I, when I came out of, when I graduated in, in, in computer science, like at the, the, you know, at the master's level or diploma level back then, um, you thought, no, well, I, I don't need it, but you also wouldn't have expected that, um, that, you know, Raxamel would grow so much and we will be maintained over so many years. This is the problem. Um, at, in the beginning, you don't really, you don't really know whether bioinformatics tool you have designed will become widely used or not. So, um, I, I think it, it's okay for rapid prototyping. It's okay to write messy code or quick code. I think that's okay to see if something is adopted by the community. But as soon as you see that there, you get user requests, uh, there are failures, et cetera, et cetera. Then I think has, is, is the point where you, where you have to, um, 
where you have to kind of uh, think about a redesign early on to rewrite it from scratch. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, I, because so much of, of this practice, you know, of, of establishing conventions for yourself and following them or figuring out the conventions in the field, it's about anticipating the ways in which things can fail or, or, or anticipating common fail modes. And exactly as you say, until you have experience, it's just really difficult to understand the relative uh, importance of those. But you can also get into a situation, I think, where something is over engineered in the sense that you're you're putting so much into the best practices that you're just you know you're not shipping essentially um, and that's that's really hard to know i like i like what you said about you know get something out there see how it's how it's doing and then invest your effort uh, as as it gets traction that that seems like a, a really good perspective but unfortunately it's partially inconsistent with the way in biology that we ship products you know which is this idea that you have a single version that corresponds to a, a paper uh in reality software development works much better as a far more iterative process i think yeah, yeah that, that, that's that's for sure it's 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 almost impossible to predict in which ways the, the, the software you've developed will be used or, you know, also what kind of new models or methods will come up. Like, you know, this, this concept of phylogenetic terraces, it hasn't been that long since it was discovered and described. And this is something that nobody had thought of uh, previously. And so, you know, it's, you, you always have to expect, like if you write a tool for something that other people will analyze or discover interesting aspects mm -hmm. uh, about the problem and you you would probably have to adapt your tool to take them into account so it's, it's fortunately we're still finding out new things about phylogenetics oh yeah that's for sure and i'm wondering where you think like over the next 15 to 20 years most of the gains will be made in phylogenetics is it just getting the the numerical stuff faster uh is it Tree proposal, of course, if you just propose the maximum likelihood tree as the first tree, you're, you're already there. Uh, or uh, or uh, is it, um, you know, the other part of the, the numerical piece is we've been doing things in software and there's sort of this ebb of flow of how important hardware architecture is. And especially being driven by machine learning now, uh, where we have tensor processing units and things like there's actually silicon native graph processing that's just starting to happen now. And I wonder if phylogenetics might move on to specialized hardware sooner than maybe some of us were thinking. Is there much runway in that direction? Yeah, it's it's hard to tell. So with, with specialized hardware, the, it's always the question, you know, well, how large the market is. You know, do we really want specialized hardware, which is even more complex to implement, even if you have like reconfigurable hardware, this is much more complex to implement than like, you know, 60 different versions of the uh, function to, to update the conditional right. architectures. So basically you, you sacrifice even more flexibility. And you need somebody who's still uh, well trained to 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 design or at least reconfigure such a hardware. Um, so I think it it is uh, it is rather difficult. So we may eventually see some some uh, improvement in um, of of the heuristics of the tree search heuristics by some machine learning methods. But you know this has to be test has to be tested and seen. Uh, also taking into account like you know how, how long the learning time is um, so there definitely there there are some things that can happen in terms of hardware I don't know I think the major so what we've seen with the you know with the uh, coronavirus pandemic now is that uh, well we we're able to easily paralyze very wide alignments like whole genome alignments uh, but it's very difficult to uh, paralyze computations on extremely large trees, right? Because um, if you look at the coronavirus data, well, the, the genome is, is 30,000 bases long, but the actual, like the sites that are um, different, like the, the, the variable sites are maybe one to two or 3,000 now. And so you have like this very 
small amount of information for building like a huge tree with maybe now, uh, I don't know, half a million taxa or even more. Um, and so this, those kind of, so now here we have, we cannot parallelize over sites just because we don't have that many. It will not scale. So here we need to, to parallelize the tree search. And this is a very hard thing to do because we have all those sequential dependencies. You know, I move the tree here, then I need to re-optimize the branch lengths, then I try another move. So I cannot really, it's very hard to change this tree simultaneously at many positions because all those changes kind of need to be propagated back to the other changes I've made. Um, so, so this is something I would I would see as a challenge to 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 be able to achieve some sort of scalability in uh, in this dimension, like in the, with respect to the number of taxa, because as you know, as we've seen now, this is something that people are forced to do or need to do uh, in the future. Do you, do you think that maybe we're too fixated on actual you know nucleotides and things as the appropriate unit of of uh, representation like that, like you're talking about a very large, you know, matrix there that it, where the information is quite sparse. So it it seems like intuitively, of course, we could represent that information in a much smaller matrix, but maybe we could also perform our mathematical operations on that much more compact mm -hmm. representation directly. Yeah, I, th I think there, um, I mean, there have been some first attempts uh, attempts in, in, in this direction. And uh, now given how much data we have, um, this is definitely, um, I think this is definitely a way to go. So we also made some experiments ourselves trying to compress the data because, you know, if you need a supercomputer to analyze, to build a tree of, I don't know, 200 bird genomes or, or whatever. And now this is, I think in two or three years, this will become like a standard data set like, uh, that a graduate yep. student will analyze. Absolutely. Um, that we need to think about, you know, filtering out data or compressing the data or representing it in another form um, because we just don't have the computing power to do it. And of course, the, you know, there's also the, the, the issue of the CO2 footprint of all those calculations. Yep. And, fortunately, you know, evolutionary biologists are generally worried about the environment. Um, so this is, I think, another uh, factor that should lead us to, to maybe, um, you know, compute less resource and or phylogenies in a less resource intensive way. And um, there are lots of ways of, of, of doing it, of course. So, you know, we can also do hardware measures like CPU clock frequency tuning and stuff like that. So this is something we're currently looking, uh, looking into, like to make all those tools a little bit more energy efficient. Um, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. And, uh, you know, working with colleagues that don't have access to high performance computing infrastructure, I, I think there's a tendency in every field to say like, my field is so special that unless you understand the fundamentals of the entire field from the ground up, don't even try using any of it. It kind of does a disservice. Like at this point, I, I'd, I'd really like to see some of this turned into an appliance that could be used out on the edge, you know, either because you're disconnected from infrastructure, like real time forensics or, or um, you know, environmental assessment stuff, or with the pandemic, the clinical need to not only like, you know, get a, a PCR test back on the sample, but to have a full sequence and have it in a, in a tree and to understand if you're in a growing cluster or something there's huge demand for essentially real-time phylogenetics. Yeah. yeah, and this is something I think we, we, we didn't anticipate maybe two years, two years ago. So we always thought this as like a, you know, nice hypothetical medical use case to do some sort of, you know, online phylogenetics algorithm. But now uh, it has turned out that this, this really is a, is a challenge. Yeah. So you've you've published on on COVID now. Were there other things that about COVID that are particularly interesting to you from a phylogenetic analysis point of view or where you think phylogenetics really has room to grow to make a big difference? Well, I, I think so. So 
the, the room to grow is definitely like the, you know, the, the clinical deployment of phylogenetics, like this, let's call it uh, online phylogenetics, um, which just wasn't available now. I mean, Next Strain and some other tools did like an extremely good job in trying to, to keep up. But I mean, we need to develop novel methods to, to, to facilitate access to this. Mm -hmm. In general, you know, the, 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 the key thing about the um, coronavirus data from my point of view was just this huge number of taxa and low number of variable sites. So this very kind of weak signal um, in the data um, that showed us that, you know, they shouldn't just be uh, like compute one maximum likelihood tree or do one maximum likelihood search, but do um, 100 and then look at the, the you know, the, if the likelihoods of those 100 trees are significant or not. So those that are not significantly different from each other should really be summarized in a thing that we called like a plausible tree set. So in a sense, because it's really funny, so we have those very large trees and we have such a kind of fuzzy signal, we're becoming more Bayesian in the analysis. Mm -hmm. right? So we're somehow mm -hmm. trying to build a plausible tree set. And what we were advocating for was to say, okay, since the signal is so small and all trees are like kind of equally plausible or have cannot be distinguished statistically from each other, we should use summary statistics to 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 summarize or describe the little signal we have in this plausible tree set. So, um, and it's also interesting to think about the way other categories of information could become incorporated, like geography or time. So, if you have two sequences that each have a rare mutation, if they're drawn from the same city in the same month, you're yes. more likely to place them in a clade, whereas if they're on opposite sides of the world, separated by months, they're probably not. So Exactly, uh, yeah. We, we definitely need more data of a different type or to integrate additional data types into those calculations to make them a little bit more practical. Yeah, but then that tugs directly against what we were just saying about generality and optimization. It's going to be really hard to write the 6,000 functions that are needed, you know, for like, you do have geography, you don't have geography, you're using GTR, you're not using GTR. Yeah, so. yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. We, we for, I think we first need to find like a good model for this, for, for integrating everything. And then, you know, we'll figure out a way of, of implementing the, that efficiently. But I think we're kind of rather in search in search yeah. of this unifying model still. Yeah. Uh, that is that would still be, you know, computationally feasible in one way or the other. Yeah. Uh, have you thought much about machine learning and phylogenetic inference? You've mentioned it a few times, like specifically, I'm I kind of feel like <laughs> not making a bet, but starting to anticipate where it's going to have the biggest impact because there's so many places it could. So one would be just in straight up tree proposal, like like figuring out which moves are most promising. The other would be um, state space changes. So for example, using auto encoders to collapse either the actual mm -hmm. sequence data um, spaces down or the tree spaces down. Uh, and, uh, you know, one thing that really fascinates me is how we represent trees, because that intrinsically defines how we think about adjacency in tree space and things. And I, I feel like using machine learning in particular to, to parameterize, well, to come up with a description of tree space might really help us think about adjacency of trees. Um, and then like the dream would be, you know, something that takes in a multiple sequence alignment and then, you know, a network that emits a tree, although I, I don't know, who knows? Yeah, yeah, but who knows, like if we have a... <laughs> If we have enough in, inferred trees, maybe um, uh, the machine could learn that. So I think we're still a little bit far away from that. Um, you know, another um, another application area would be uh, would be model testing, mm -hmm. um, where where you could do that. Um, so we've tried that maybe five years ago. So before the big machine learning. Um, well, it's not really a hype, but before machine learning came, became computationally feasible, let's say. Um, well, there we found out that we had a pretty good prediction uh, on, on simulated data, but we didn't have good prediction on, um, on real data. So 
Um, I, I think the problem is that, you know, we don't have any ground truth. And so how, how do we, how do we really, so, so for tree searches, of course, we have some sort of ground truth. We have a baseline program and can compare against this baseline program. But in terms of reconstruction accuracy, we don't have ground truth and just basing everything uh, just on simulations and maybe even training uh, the, the neural network or whatever machinery we use um, based on simulated data is very, very dangerous, right? Because we, we all experience that empirical data behaves differently. Absolutely. And this is also a trend I've seen in, in population genetics a lot where um, those, the, the, those neural networks or whatever mechanism is being used are mostly trained uh, on simulated data that has been generated using the mechanistic models we've been using so far for inference that are yeah. kind of perfect and we know that they are unrealistic. So um, we also need to be very, very careful like in doing or applying this to, to domains for which we don't have any, any ground truth. It almost makes me think that maybe the biggest contribution of machine learning could be generative to produce, you know, data sets, these, you know, generative adversarial networks or something to come up with, with data that look like something real. Yeah, so, uh, so actually, this is, this is something we're kind of looking at as well. So to, to deploy those methods a little bit, like to do an intelligent exploration of simulation space, to find those area of simulation space, because this is always a pro problem, right? So like in which, if you simulate sequence data uh, along a tree, how do you set your rates? How do you set your branches? Where do you get your tree shapes from? And so this, this is an idea we have and we're currently looking at is to, to, if we're able, so there are a lot of frameworks for this already available. So if, if, if we're able to apply this to different questions in phylogenetics, and um, you know, figure out where we're like IQ tree, which are the cases where IQ tree fails and RaxML doesn't, or where do both fail, or where is there a difference, the largest, or something like that. So, so cool. Yeah. This, this is this is something we're we're trying to to we're currently looking at actually. Yeah. I mean, the big joke now is like with transformers and ML and everything, everything is converging on just image data. Like what if you could just make a PNG of the alignment and train a network to just output the PNG of the, of the tree. It's uh, so yeah, yeah, everything that, else is converting to an image problem. That's really, yeah, that would be sad, I guess. Yeah, that would be very sad. Are you looking for postdocs or students or, or any specific types of collaborators or anything right now? Well, we're, we're of course, always uh, open for, for collaborations. They somehow just emerge by themselves. Um, yeah, currently, so I don't have any, any postdoc positions, but I'm always uh, interested in, uh, in hiring a new PhD students. So there, you know, there's no uh, open position um, announced somewhere, but we can, so we, we have this flexibility in Germany that we can hire at any point in time. Um, so, you know, whoever uh, would be interested is, is, is welcome to, to inquire, of course. And um, the, our lab is pretty international. So we already have one American who joined the lab. Uh, so Great. like brain drain the other way around, so to say. Yeah and uh, people from all over Europe. So uh, it's a very international uh, crowd. Excellent. Yeah, that's that's really great. Cool. Well, thank you uh, so much for talking with me. And uh, we should definitely you, catch Katie. up more often than this. Um, I hope so, so too. I hope yeah. so too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, who knows where we'll, when we can all travel again, but it'd be great to hang out in person yeah. sometime again soon. So yeah, you do um, miss colleagues and students after some time. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I mean, that's part of why I've been doing these videos is I just, you know, miss having casual no, conversations. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, really so great it's uh it's super fun. So okay, well have a great evening. Uh enjoy mm -hmm. Crete. <laughs> so I am, I am. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. Okay. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.